Good, 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 good. Okay. You calmed your hair at least. I did, yeah. All of uh, all of the hair that was sticking on top of my head last week is now back here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kish, did you did you comb your hair? Uh, not so much. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I was only informed an hour ago that I have to do the call. So. Mm, okay. That's right. <laughs> hey, Kish, are you in the uh, in the office? It looks like you've got some uh, some robotics behind you. Is that your office? Yes, that's our workshop here. Cool. So cool. it's not virtual background; it's the real background. Right. Are you one of them? <laughs> not the real Kish. <laughs> 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 You can give me a robot represent me today. Yeah, and <laughs> potentially give me a capture to see. Yeah, that'll be the day. Right, right. Uh, avatar will just speak for us. We'll go on vacation. <laughs> Robo Kish. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, I see. Uh, Kira was just about to join. Um, I think she joined as an attendee and then um, jumped out. So she should be coming back any moment now. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start that poll um, and I'm going to leave it live. Um, so I'm going to start the poll and I'll ask everyone to to vote what you think. Uh, the question here, uh, welcome, by the way, for those of you that started to uh, to listen and to watch us uh, on implanting industry 4.0 into the future. Uh, I'm here joined with uh, several of my colleagues, uh, which we'll introduce in a moment. Uh, but I thought uh, just to get started, I would have everyone uh, participate in this poll. And the poll question is, COVID-19 will change Industry 4.0 forever. So if you please choose yes or no, or I cannot decide. Maybe you're <clears throat> mentally paralyzed by such a provocative question right at the beginning. <laughs> Hello, Viren. How are you? Uh, Viren, I cannot hear. Can others hear Viren? No. And also, I think we need to get Kira join as a speaker. Kira is, is an attendee, yes. Yeah, um, yeah, I wish I could. Um, no, I will, I will say hello to her. I ask her to switch over to us as the attendee. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Stan. I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so far we have a unanimous <laughs> answer to the poll question right now. Everyone who has voted has said yes. Uh, COVID-19 will change industry 4.0 forever. Uh, which I, I find fascinating, and we are um, we're about to talk about this for the next uh, forty or forty five minutes. Um, so, without further ado, uh, what I would like to do, uh, I'm going to end the poll. By the way, because it uh, now unanimous, uh, everyone that has voted, and we've got nine people who have voted. Everyone has said yes. COVID nineteen will change industry four point zero forever. So nobody thinks this is just a temporary uh, impact to industry four point zero. Uh, let's see if any of our panelists uh, disagree. So I'm going to uh, end this poll right now. And the poll is ended. And what I'd like to do is I would like to welcome everyone to the session. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin by introducing myself, and then I'll go around and ask each one of the panelist members to provide a brief introduction uh, to themselves and their organization. Um, I'm going to do my best on this call to speak as little as possible because <laughs> Uh, as the um, as the host, I know the least of all of these uh, panelists about the particular topic. So I'm here to facilitate. My name is Ed Adams. Um, I'm uh, the CEO of Security Innovation, and I also host a monthly talk show called Ed Talks on various cybersecurity topics. <clears throat> Let me please uh, kick it over to you, Stan, to introduce yourself, if you will. Oh, great. Um, by the way, I got a message from Kira. She said she couldn't log in as a speaker. She contact the uh, company who runs the software to try to get a response how to switch it. She had a problem switching. So she just had to attend as a uh, attendees for now. Okay. Well, hopefully we can hear from Kira soon, um, even just by uh, entering in some comments uh, or the questions in the, the bottom right-hand okay. um, area of the screen. 
Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. My name is Stan Fong. I'm a MD with Foresight Ventures. It's a family office investment fund. We invest in both public and private companies. Uh, but before I become uh, my own shop owner, I have been doing venture capital for 30 years uh, in institutional areas. So primarily invest in TMT space. Um, first, I uh, started in Boston and then go national. In the last 10 years, I actually have been commuting back and forth between US and China, invest in both countries, targeting really global startup firms in the uh, technology space. And hopefully bring public and go acquire good prices. This is my job. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Rufus. Uh uh, thank you. Um, my name is Rufus Littman. Um, I have a background with PhD studies and, and some severe uh, work within, within, the, within data. Um, and uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur uh, with six ventures, two, three, okay, exits. And uh, before that has been working with, with corporations all over the world in more than 100 companies and, and uh, with working with, with digital strategy for, for big, big corporations and and writing a couple of books and, and uh, launching some apps with a couple of million uh, downloads, etc. Great. And, and presently, you're focused in the um, tech education space, yes? Yes, yes. Now, I, now I got the company in in Singapore, based in Singapore, with a, with a development in Vietnam and and uh, uh, content migration in, in Philippines, etc. So rather rather um, Asian company, uh, focusing on emerging markets, uh, education technology for for emerging markets. Fantastic. Uh, Viren, please introduce. Ah, sorry, we still cannot hear you, Viren. Uh, all right. So um, Viren is the chief executive officer for Sigma Electric Manufacturing Corporation. Uh, and he's joining us um, <clears throat> from uh, the USA, uh, as I am, as well as, uh, as Stan. Um, hopefully we can get Viren's uh uh, situation sorted out. Um, you appear to be muted, Viren, so uh, maybe we can unmute you at some point in time. Um, but with that, let me uh, turn it over to Kish, please. Hi, so my name is Kishant, so in short, Kish. Um, so I represent Macro Robotics here today. I am the CTO of Macro Robotics. Um, we have been uh, in the field of service robotics for hospitality sector since 2014. And uh, we have expanded our global presence uh, with headquartered in uh, Sevilla, Spain, uh, where we have our manufacturing facility. Uh, and also we have a development center in India. Uh, and lately we have expanded to a sales office in the uh, United States, in New York. Um, so uh, our main focus is in the hospitality sector and to create uh, solutions based on robotics for food and beverages automation. So that's wow. very cool. Very cool. So yeah. robots that will, will serve me a cocktail. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> that's perfect for COVID days, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, terrific. Terrific. Um, all right. So let me, let me start with uh, the first question. Uh, and, and Kish, actually I'll start with you since uh, you have the coolest backdrop since you have a, an actual robot in the background. Uh, you get to kick us off here. Uh, so Industry 4.0, it's all about inclusion and transparency and decentralized decisions. So how does this become more or less challenging in the post-COVID world? Yep. So that's an exciting question uh, because I think the way that industry has been working for the past two decades ever since post-industrialization, uh, um, we have to a certain extent hit a saturation point, but we have been revolving around the saturation point for the last decade. And we needed an external factor to push us to the next level. Um, but it's sad that such a health crisis has been this external factor. Uh, however, it, we could take remote jobs, work from home, door delivery, homeschooling, or virtual fairs many of these things were more of a luxury or an optional uh, things in the pre-COVID era. Uh, but now I think these have more become an essential part of our work environment. Um, so I would put say that 
humans work at the comfort of technology and not the vice versa in this industry 5.0 so i think post covid the world is definitely going to be less challenging for uh, fast forwarding with the 4.0 implementation or i could say to begin with 5.0 Yeah, very interesting. You know, we have been talking for uh for years about using drones to deliver packages and um mobile grocery stores that will come to you. Um but so you think that COVID has really served as a catalyst to make this uh much more accessible and necessary for everyone. Yes, uh yeah. certainly in uh, in macro robotics uh point of view, like we have our interest from the customers has peaked Uh, at least by tenfold. Uh, wow! So, Good for yeah. you. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, Stan or Rufus, comment. Yeah, and uh, I think one of the things I will bring up along the way is, uh, given that we have a global audience, I know not just in this group, but in, in Horasis Horizon, uh, Horizons, we cover a lot of emerging countries, particularly in Africa, Southeast Asia, and uh, South America. Sometimes when we have comments from a developed world we always assuming that the world is the same consistent across the board and doesn't right uh, so i think in the developed world we see certainly see the speeding up of adoptions uh remote learning remote healthcare treatments but i just wonder you know if we take the same because i follow a company that does e-commerce in africa uh kojumia of nigeria and they just don't have the same pace of they or speeding up as Southeast Asia uh, or or the uh, Alibaba of China or Amazon US so i think we got to be aware that when we talk about speeding up of the adoption things are being the more digital and uh, become more remote uh we have to look at the degree of speed of change that's important to remember and so hopefully as um the united nations or global development agencies sees that will start to shift resources to help the emerging countries which is half the world right go under that radar screen and it doesn't cost a lot I mean, from relative scale of capital cost but it does provide huge impacts uh, on the adoption and speeding up of the uh, digitization so so something to remember as we make the yeah, we comment on the on the way of change including 5G's including the emerging adoption of um, uh, digital remote world Right, right. So let me let me shift a little bit to more sort of um a social question. Um and, and actually Rufus, I'll start with you on this one uh, because you uh in in our our preparation sessions really uh, helped uh, consolidate this. Uh so hopefully I'll I'll do it justice here. Uh but in the pre-covid world, uh governments were sort of losing traction of power to large corporations and citizens. Um and culture had shifted to more of a focus on on what you called people and planet, which I think was a a, a very nice uh, pithy term. Uh, obviously technology enabled this uh, this transition but um after covid um uh, it seems like governments uh, have taken or seized the opportunity to claw back some power and it certainly has happened in 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 my country in america and i think in the west in general um and the desire to invest in people and planet at the same time has never really been greater so um that technology that has catalyzed this critical business transformation like the work from home uh, and the you know sort of instant remote uh, education which is sort of thrust upon us um you know making us a, a truly digital society overnight so how will this affect the ongoing waves for power for the power structure uh, in the cultural movement focusing on uh, doing good for the people and the planet mm Yeah I I'd like I'd like to to uh, it's a super interesting question of course and it's a question of power um but uh, pre and pre and post covid but I'd like to reframe the question and 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 uh, in order to get a real good answer uh, for that is is to to, to choose the, the right per- perspective and like you say uh, the the perspective uh, there are advantages of looking at it from, from a government perspective or a corporate perspective uh but as you say um when when governments has been losing their power to to corporations and to to people uh there there, there comes something that that is is rather fun is that that uh, you know governments listen to people one day every fourth year no that's 0.1% of the time 
uh, that that governments listen to people in the Western society in dictatorships. They don't listen to you to you at all. Or eventually they have to, but but uh, momentarily they they don't. Um, so that gives a lot of power to 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 actually to to the pe- to the people when looking for uh, when um, from from a company perspective. Because companies uh, listen to their 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 consumers every day. Uh, if you if you if you don't like your company, you will stop buying from the company, and the the, the company will die. So the relationship between, between the the consumer and the company is much more empowered uh, than that between the citizen and the government, which which gives the the I think the the perspective for looking at what's going to happen with uh, between pre and post COVID. The people perspective is the most important one, the most crucial one for doing the trend spotting. What will what, what will happen ahead? What is the single most important thing that's happened to people uh, during COVID-19? The single most important thing, uh, apart from the one million that died and, and the tragedy for their relatives, etc., but for all the rest of, of the billions of people all over the world, for, for us, what is the single most important thing? The dramatic change is social distancing. Uh, and social distancing is, is totally opposite what happened during the first revolution, the second industrial revolution, and the third re- uh, industrial revolution, which brought us together. You know? uh, so now uh, we are doing, doing social distancing. And in one part, that is consolidating things that has been happening before. That is consolidating that we have been doing remote shopping before. Uh, that's Now that's totally dramatically uh, being, being consolidated with, with, with Alibaba, like you say, and for, for, for Amazon, etc. Uh, we have been doing remote relations before. Uh, now that's totally exploding for, for Facebook and and and, and uh, Tencent, etc. That's et right. That's right. And, and, mm-hmm. and we have been doing re- remote uh, re- remote banking, remote uh, entertainment, and now it's exploding for Spotify, Netflix, etc. So that's being consolidated. But the two most important things in people's lives, the two absolutely most important things that brings us resources in order to do this shopping and entertainment, that is going to work and going to school. And that's traditionally brick and mortar uh, events, and uh, there's only been been some early adopters that has been doing some some e learning and, and some remote working. But uh, in traditionally, it's been brick and mortar uh, events. Now, during the social distancing on COVID nineteen, that's totally, totally, totally changed. And that I think is the absolutely most important thing when looking at at, at uh, what is going to happen uh, in the po- post corona society. Uh, what will the remote work and the remote school, what will that, that make for, for, for all the rest of, of, of the society when going from the fourth industrial revolution to the fifth industrial revolution? Hmm. Yep. Uh, others, others thoughts or comments on this? I mean, it's, it, it's a real, we could talk about this one topic for a, you know, a full 45 minutes, but uh, others have a thought on this. Uh, yeah, I think mean, just uh, one point supporting what Rufus said. Uh, in fact, when I went to the harasses, uh, global meeting last April, uh, one, one of the comments I made was similar to what you made earlier reference is the shift of power from uh, government to corporation. And I think it's a permanent shift. Um, uh, it's not reversible. It's just a migration of power uh, because there are more corporations now that crosses countries, uh, every one of them, right? Like Facebook is in 80% of the world versus US is in one country of the world, right? compare the power between the two, you would say Facebook has uh, actually more power influencing individuals around the world, at least 3 billion people overnight than the uh, U.S. itself. That shift is permanent, and these um, COVID just speed up the shift. So maybe there's a temporary pull back to more central power. I mean, primarily because they can print money. And if they cannot print money, no one would, would care. <laughs> so in fact, they print a lot of money, they have more power, influence decisions. So the question becomes, when it all settles down a year from now, two years from now, and back to a normal track without the epidemics between us, what would the change be? I would say go back to the same thing. The corporation, as we become what I actually call a corporate state, without mm-hmm. a better word mm-hmm. for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is just the nature of migration of power over history. So the corporate states will become more powerful than nation states, and they'll in fact get more powerful as we go along. Especially in the last six months, the evaluation have even got quicker, stronger, sure. faster, right than the nations themselves. Now, so the question becomes: It's a personal perspective. Is that permanent or is it temporary? 
uh, I think it's permanent. Some others may argue it's temporary, and the the uh, the, uh, the government will still get more power back as we shift forward, and there'll be conflict between them. Uh, see, see between Trump and Bezos, right? They're in conflict all day long. Mm-hmm. So, well, and and it was already headed this way, like you were saying, with you know, right. Facebook and their Libra um, initiative, uh, literally trying to <laughs> to print money right. um, and and digital money, but uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, based or blockchain based money. Um, right. So they they are on much more of a direct um, conflict. Right. So the technology, the five G that we talk about, uh, fourth generation, it's all just going to speed up the process. Well, that means you have to add on to the fuel to make the migration of a uh, mm-hmm. corporate state a lot quicker, more powerful, and more permanent. And maybe we just have to live with it. <laughs> yeah, that could be. <laughs> that could be. Uh, okay, let, let me shift a little bit. Um, folks in the manufacturing and the robotics oh. areas. Um, so <clears throat> obviously, you know, work from home and school from home uh, changed kind of overnight. Um, and, and COVID had a massive impact on that. But what about manufacturing and factories and smart factories? You know, what has the impact been there in, in that kind of industrial um, industrial world? Uh, so, Viren, if you're if you're with us with voice yet, then uh, <laughs> can feel free to uh, to offer. Uh, otherwise, I'll toss it over to Kish to start. Um, so, Viren is, I think Viren is not even there. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't see him at all. I drop off. He dropped up. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. He did. All right. So, Kish, off to you then. Yeah. So, I think it's a hard-hitting reality for most organizations lately that most of their operations are potentially possible remotely, uh, which otherwise was Mm. happening face-to-face. It could be sales calls, marketing activities, to to an extent, even product development, uh, software updates, or... I would say, except for the most essential jobs, the rest was be the rest is being done with the help of technology in the past six months. Uh, businesses, although hit a slight downward curve, I think it's mostly an adoption rate or the transformation time that has caused this downward curve. Uh, but I guess businesses will thrive better than ever due to this uh, home working uh, reality. Um, and in terms of manufacturing or factories, uh, because, you know, it's easy for some works to be from work from home. But uh, when it comes to uh, factories or manufacturing, um, I think it's something that we have been working on uh, in the pre-COVID era as well. Um, virtual or augmented reality has enabled real-time monitoring even prior to covid um, and uh, even robotics clubbed with this virtual reality and augmented reality um, would enable real-time remote manipulation uh, mm-hmm. to a greater extent. So um, in terms of macro robotics, one such thing is where uh, previously we have these packed food items that are mass manufactured in an industry and then sent over to the supermarkets uh, but I think uh, with this evolution, um, we could potentially have uh, robots working in the restaurant, preparing mm. you know individual dishes, and with the help of virtual reality or augmented reality club with robotics, uh, an expert chef could be cooking from his home, but it would be the robot actually cooking for him in the kitchen. Uh, that's a very interesting perspective. Um, yeah. So, and you know, I, I have seen. Um, organizations like uh, Boston Robotics, for example, um, historically, um, you know, they, they build um, essentially robots that sort of look like dogs um, and and kind of kind of walk and act and talk like dogs. But they can also open doors. They have human yep. robots that can do flips, all that sort of stuff. Um, but they didn't have a lot of um, real demand for their products. Uh, and I thought it was interesting that you said demand uh, for your um, macro robotics has gone up tenfold in post-COVID yep. times. I've seen some of the uh, the Boston Robotics, um, like the spot in their dog, is being used at places like um, like Amazon.com in the pick and pack factories, walking around doing temperature checks automatically. So the the, ro- the robots are are kind of doing that. Um, so I, you know, I, I I'm guess, sorry. I'm, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Ed. No, go ahead, please. Yeah. So uh, I guess. Where, where Maco is functioning is kind of like the 
uh, essential goods like food is more like an essential thing and uh, it could be lockdown or it could be another uh, lockdown in the future food is something essential and uh, i think that's the reason why we are seeing the interest rising uh, because many restaurants or food sector want to become more stable not depending on any kind of resources uh, and uh, i think to sum up the question um, like any uh, experienced staff is needed for any sector um, where computer skills are more like an essential skill these days even if it's a restaurant sector or industries or e-commerce in future whatever skills it is i think virtual reality or augmented reality getting to know how to work with robots would become would become like an essential skill and uh, anything apart from that would be a core skill for them Mm. So that it's an interesting point though because in pre-covid uh the a lot of challenges with industry 4.0 included the uh, high capital expenses um lack of trained staff to operate uh, and troubleshoot um those you know those technologies so uh, how has this changed in the last 6 months uh, and and anyone can answer that one whether it's um it's Kish or uh, Stan or Rufus feel free um i think i can uh, give please Okay. start us off yeah so i think that mostly just temporary changes in the last 6 months uh that should also be with uh, work from home to certain extent because um we say that work from home is highly possible for most operation but there are essential things such as brainstorming or uh, creating a hardware product uh that requires people to interact physically and then uh create a product um so i think some to some extent these changes wouldn't last long uh although this has prepared most businesses to be ready for whatever is forthcoming and uh as i previously mentioned i think uh it was in the economic uh within the power question uh where people were speaking about how things are going to change between government and uh, private organizations um i think that would be a change from linear economy to a circular economy mm-hmm. and that is probably a side effect of this covid crisis mm-hmm. um so i think that's going to be more permanent change uh, in terms of economic operations right i have a comment to to add to this discussion is in the sense of i think there are two major themes that affect that question one is just of course the covid that uh, that becomes a uh, like a driver for speeding up the automation the uh, the process of supply chain integration but the other change that just has been ongoing the last couple of years with the uh, conflict uh between US and China on on trade policies and there was shift the war into two camps of technology development is is going to happen as we speak mm-hmm. so China is going to launch its own blockchain and they are way ahead of the rest of the world in some of the standard blockchain configuration and infrastructures and i know for a fact that when china set up supply chain manufacturing setup it just go straight to internet 4.0 they just shift to skip the whole generation everything is most advanced in automation and you don't care about the impact on labor uh mm-hmm. uh at all they just simply say use the best so they are not shown publicly but it's there right and then with that trade conflict there is getting harder every day and become two different path of development and us will end up going to insource a lot of production back in the us and you go straight to automation too you're not going to take yep. hard labor to what we used to do 50 years ago <laughs> build, build, build cars it just goes to most advanced automation and so i think that will actually be the second really drivers besides the covid to speed up the process as well that there will be two path of development in tech platform infrastructures and and, I, and the standards and speed but there will be sped up because of the two events that happen at the same time Right, right. Um hey, Rufus, do you have any thoughts on uh, on how COVID is going to increase conflict, uh, whether it's between two nation states or it's between um you know corporations and government? 
Wow, uh, conflict is a, is, a, is a big subject. No, I think it it um, it should be uh, the opposite direction. Um, actually, I think it's uh, when we're doing again taking the the people's perspective. Uh, if we're going for for or a lot is going to happen. That, like you were talking about before, uh, the, there were all already a new generation with a cultural movement for for or uh, taking more more uh, focus on on the the people and the planet uh, before, and that has that is going to be accelerated uh, due to COVID nineteen. When you've seen that or the things that the governments before said that was impossible, that we've actually seen during the lockdown that it was possible, and it has affected the the, the environment. No. So uh, when getting such evidence like that, that will get, again, with, with people having a, a lot of power as consumers, not only as citizens, but as consumers, uh, that will make uh, people moving in that, th- the same direction as companies. And that is, is uh, taking more uh, care of the planet and, and be, being more inclusive to, to, to people. So I don't think sees, I, I, there's, there's always going to be, be conflicts. And I think that's between companies more, more than, than between uh, people, uh, people, and the other cons- constituents, uh, because there will be uh, a fight for the hegemony. Because there, there will be, <laughs> there will be a hegemony uh, in all these verticals. Uh, there are no, not room for everyone, but there will be two, three uh, companies in, in all these uh, sections, so to speak, and they will have a more p- power. And uh, co- commenting on what Stan was saying before, that he was, he was seeing this as a permanent uh, drive for for remote work and, and remote uh, school. Uh, People are, the humans are uh, the species that are the most adaptable on the planet, except for rats and cockroaches. Uh, so this, uh, and now we've- That's adapted, good company to keep. Yes. <laughs> now we've adapted to, to, to the remote work and remote schooling. Then we're seeing that we're adapting to it. We're seeing the advantages of it. This will be a permanent uh, drive. And uh, this permanent drive will probably drive, uh, uh, make us, uh, less, uh, hopefully, and and probably in less conflict, at least between uh, at least with, between people. Interesting, interesting. So I, I want to build on something that uh, Kish had mentioned earlier. Um, I have this image of, in my head because he was talking about uh, an expert chef working from home, and there's a robot that's you know in the kitchen. Uh, in the restaurant, actually preparing the meal, and I just had this vision of someone like a you know, chef Gordon Ramsay screaming at the robot, "No, you didn't chop it right." Um, but, <laughs> um, so, but my question there is: so, you know, remote working, um, you know, it will it make the employee more powerful versus corporate employers, or will it make the employer employee, sorry, more vulnerable for replacement by robotic processes? Uh, automation, artificial intelligence. Uh, Stan, what do you think? Yeah, well, that's what 4G is all about, right? The um, the fourth industrial revolution is all about uh, all the edge computing, all the computer talking to computers, all the processes being automated without human interaction, responses being made based on circumstantial changes around it. It's going to, it's going to happen. This is not the speed around which it will happen. That means there'll be less reliant on human being. Uh, making decisions, and obviously what it means is a bit less need to depend on human being making interaction and decisions. Now, I'm more worried about that because as we all talk about, human adapt to changes. So there'll be new jobs being created, there'll be new um, work settings that's being created, more home than home office, and more leisure time that we'll figure out what to do with them, and there'll be more entertainment, more other use of our time. So I think we adapt to it and you can probably end up make as much income by working as hours. Um, you can do it today if you're a good stock trader, right? As is. Right, right. <laughs> if you buy and go away for five years and come back, you'll probably be wealthier, right? So yeah. I think that there is kind of a shift to make it different for what, what was work, what's defined, what was the definition of work. And so I think people adapt to it, so. I think there's uh, the two, two dimensions uh, working simultaneously here, uh, yeah. and one is is uh, what you, you were talking about. Well, the, the, we we're becoming vulnerable when we're doing remote work. Uh, all the work needs to be more uh, specified uh, because we need we need to set KPI on everything, and we need to have the security of of the delivery, etc. So then it's going to be, and when it's when it's specified, then it's documented, and when it's documented mm-hmm. and specified, then it can be digitalized, and then. Uh, you you can uh, you don't need people anymore because we can have the RPA doing that or or an AI uh, doing it instead. So there is a vulnerability for for remote work. Uh, giving out uh, everything will become digital and and 
then why, why need people? But at the same time, uh, we all also have this, uh, this thing with the competitive advantage. We don't only, uh, now we're not only uh, going applying for work at the local community because we can, can apply for, for any company in the world, no? Mm -hmm. uh, doing the ro remote work. Everything will be offshore. There will be nothing that is onshore. Uh, so, or, or everything will be on, online, so to speak. Uh, so, so then you're getting a competitive advantage. You don't have to, to uh, you're not so vulnerable for, for getting exploited on the local market. You can actually, with your specialty, uh, again, going back to you have to do uh, more learning during, during remote. It, it all works together with the remote education. Uh, you will be, become so specialized. There will always be a company in the world that would need your your skills. Uh, so that I think is a, a, a two two dimensions here that uh, hopefully they will balance each other, so to speak. Yeah, I, I do think that's interesting. So you think that there are some vulnerabilities for humans to get replaced, uh, such mm -hmm. as you know Gordon Ramsay's sous chef, um, but. Mm -hmm you think that also there's a lot more opportunities because essentially geographic boundaries have disappeared. Yes. Interesting, interesting. Okay. Um, we actually do have a question from the audience I'd like to address. Um, this is from Natalie uh, Semovich. She's the head of innovation strategy for Resilient Group. Um, and Natalie says, um, <clears throat> in 4.0 in manufacturing post COVID, will we see a boost in advanced manufacturing within territories that were losing to offshore markets previously? Uh, are the advances in, uh, in Industry 4.0, are they strong enough as a tipping point to reverse or alter some of those trends? Yes, let me jump on that. That is uh, what I mentioned earlier. Uh, is that there'll be a lot of, in at least in the developed world, there'll be a lot more insourcing uh, back into the uh, developed world. There'll be a lot more shifting of supply chain to other emerging countries, uh, in Southeast Asia, for example, from China. I mean, that will change, but when it happens, People are not going to just take a 25 year old manufacturing lines and plug it in and just do what we used to do 25 years ago. It all will be advanced technology, advanced software, advanced supply chain management and using AI as a way to produce it more efficiently. So I think to answer the question, yes, there'll be definitely a push for advanced development a lot quicker uh, to adopt the problem zero solutions. Mm -hmm. Akish, have you seen um, this type of trend shifting in your industry, being in the robotics manufacturing space? Yes, uh, particularly even uh, in our case as well, we have seen a change because uh, previously what we had in our product pipeline to be outsourced to uh, other countries, uh, we potentially, after the lockdown, started looking for providers within the nation uh, due to various factors. Um, although I think it's a question of uh, what level of a company, it's a question between are you a startup, a medium enterprise or a large enterprise and uh, to what extent we can bring the, we, to what extent we can bring the manufacturing, uh, reverse it. Right. So I, I think, you know, one of the positives that uh, has come out of COVID um, is this massive increase in demand for robotics, such as the ones that you generate from um, macro robotics, uh, also Boston Robotics, etc. Um, you know, previously, it was only in the sort of high margin businesses, uh, sort of like, you know, healthcare surgery, where there was a lot of robotic assistance. But, you know, you're now talking about robotics for food service industry, which historically is very thin margin. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's going to be very interesting to see if the increased demand allows you to increase your um, economies of scale, um, thus lowering pricing and making it more accessible for for uh, industries with uh, with thinner margin, uh, such as food service and, of course, education. Uh, Rufus, do you have a thought on that? Well, I think that this is this is uh, one of the two two most important things that is going to happen is is uh, with remote work and remote schooling is is. Uh, First, you have a possibility for a climate change. We've all seen what was going to happen when, when you're doing remote work and remote school. Uh, so will that be a savior for, for, for the planet? Like uh, it, we had the discussion during the plenary of climate change uh, today. Um, I don't know because there will other, other, other processes that will working in the other direction. But, but I, I'm clear, clearly optimistic regarding that. But the other one is, is, is uh, what you were talking about right now. When it comes to education, remote schools, uh, before we had like like uh, 20, 30 million, the biggest biggest companies in the world working with EdTech, they had 20, 30 million uh, su subscribers now. Now we, we're counting this in, in we have 78% of all the students in the world, we're counting 1 billion, billions, no? So then that, that's that's a catalyzation for, for remote school for real. 
And then we have the possibility for, for um, educating not only the 10% that is highly educated in the world, but actually 100% or at least uh, the 50% the 50 that, uh, that are motivated or, or, and has a mobile phone. Uh, and I think that that has never been a possibility uh, in the brick and mortar world. And now, during post-COVID-19, uh, there is a possibility for this. And, and that, is, uh, that is probably the biggest change of all. Uh, getting the, getting uh, these billion of people to getting uh, highly skilled and, and highly educated. Uh, and we will not invent one Einstein every 100 years and one Elon Musk every 10th year. We will invent an Einstein every year and an Elon Musk every month instead. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that would be a wonderful future, actually. I <laughs> would love that. Uh, we did have another question come in from the audience. And the question was, how do you see trade barriers impacting offshoring versus onshoring? Uh, now, even though we did address um, the onshore versus offshore, it wasn't necessarily around trade barriers. So uh, if any of the panelists have a thought on that, feel free. No. No. Nope. <laughs> okay, fair no, enough. No. Well, 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 it, it goes, uh, yeah, again, with, with remote work and, and remote, uh, with everything being remote, uh, we will crush uh, um, barriers. Uh, we will not invent them. Um, did we lose him? <laughs> okay. Well, um, um, Stan, let me address uh, this follow-on question came in, and this is really for you. You're um, you're in the uh, the venture capital world, uh, so the question here again coming from uh, from Natalie Samovich: uh, Will investment follow these trends, or is there a level of skepticism toward undertaking Industry 4.0 somewhat riskier capital-intensive approaches? What do you think? Uh, no, actually. Um uh, the, the switch to 4.0, in fact, 5.0 coming up is a permanent change. And one of the key part is, uh, is a convergence, right? As we all know, it's not just with IoT by itself, it's 5G, IoT, AI, edge computing. A number of changes happen at the same time that create this 4G world of fourth industrial revolution. That change is going to happen. It happens every 100 years in this major shift in paradigm. And we just got sped up in the last six months by the COVID events. Um, so I think as an investor, you follow the bigger theme uh, about that more importantly to make investment because it's a, it's a long-term five to seven years investment. You really right. cannot have one or two years deviation to affect your theme, thematic approach to investing. So the question will become what you happens, then you stay flexible underneath the umbrella adapt it because of the environment being changed and adopt the uh, the quick changes in, in the portfolio, in your approach and the investment to, to the environment behind it. Got it. Okay. So in our last uh, few minutes here, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask uh, our three panelists the same question and have each one of them answer it. Uh, and if you please try to keep your answer 10 words or less, which I know is not an easy thing to do. Um, so here's the question. And I'll start with Kish, then move to Rufus and finish with uh, with Stan. So Industry 4.0 was all about the convergence of technology, something Stan was just talking about. In your opinion, Industry 5.0 will be all about blank. So fill in the blank. So Industry 5.0 is going to be all about coexisting with technology or collaborating with technology. Uh, in a massive scale. Okay, great. Uh, Rufus, are you are you with us? Uh, yes, I'm. I'm here, um, and I like that. Um, I would say that it will be the final seizure of power from from uh, corporations and and um, and citizens, and which will be a permanent change that Stan was talking about. And uh, who will be using emerging technology in dramatically, uh, dramatically uh, in innovative ways in order to to uh, to make make improvements for people and the planet? And it will be so dramatic. We will even have to invent a new word. Disruptive will will not uh, be enough anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stan, to you, sir. So, I think the fourth uh, fourth generation of I like guess fourth industrial revolution just began, just happens, is a 20, 25 year cycle before it become mature. So I think I would probably wait uh, for another ten to fifteen years to answer the next question. What's the next wave? Because no one knows. Uh, because we're just so creative to create what's next. So I don't know the answer to that question. 
<laughs> Fair enough. Uh, we did have one last question that came in from the audience and hopefully we can address it in the last minute we have. Um, it was around the investment um, question a couple of minutes ago. So uh, the, the question is, what leadership culture do you see in this investment environment? And, and I think that was for you, Stan. Um, I think leaders is, uh, has its own definition. Um, people, how you lead is hard to train, is a little bit inert, a little bit uh, built in. And so you'll see it when you see it. <laughs> So I think that always is uh, the most powerful. So we always argue, do we invest in idea first or people first? Right. People first, every time. So that becomes a definition of leadership. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So uh, this session is wrapping up right now. I'd like to thank you all for your participation. Thank you for the great uh, the great panelists. Uh, joining me, Stan Fung of Farside Ventures, Rufus Lindman from uh, Air EdTech, if I said that right, hopefully I did, uh, and uh, Kish from Maco Robotics uh, in Spain. Um, thank you all. I hope you enjoy the rest of this truly extraordinary conference, and I wish you all the best. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.